Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. I'm excited today to be with two of my, uh, two guests here, Samuel Watkinson and Megan Fritz. Uh, so I want to begin first by just thanking everybody for their patience as I've tried to revamp the channel. Uh, on January 11th, my computer, my laptop literally died while I was on the Reason and Theology uh, YouTube channel. And I had to get a new laptop on my birthday. And now I just have new tech, better webcam. Everything is up to date. Uh, with that being said, I want to make the conversation now about the two guests. So I'm going to have Samuel and Megan introduce themselves briefly. I'll have Megan go first since she's kind of the star of the show. Uh, so Megan, uh, take it away. Intr tell us a little bit about your, uh, your, what you study or you know, what your research areas are and um, you know, your, your ed education and background. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Swan. So I am a visiting um, professor of philosophy at Utah State University. And my area, my primary area of research is action theory. Um, so I think about things like uh, when are our actions intentional and how do we explain what we're doing? Um, I do, I guess I do a lot of work on philosophy of religion, kind of um, that I, I sort of got thrown into that. I didn't really set out to do that and it, it kind of just ended up happening. Um, and then I also work quite a bit um, on the, the, the work of Soren Kierkegaard. Um, mm. Yeah. All right, Samuel. So oh, um, I'm Samuel Watkinson. I, I live in New Zealand, Wellington, New Zealand. I, I have studied hist a BA in history um, over the last few years, and now I'm continuing to study a second degree in um, theology with a specialization in uh, biblical studies and historical theology. Uh, I have a blog, <laughs> um, which is on history and theology. Um, it's literally just titled Historia Kai Theologia, which is just the Greek for those history and theology. Um, but it's been inactive for maybe a year, so, but I'm thinking of writing more stuff for that um, on both of those topics. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Samuel. Uh, with that being said, I'll have Samuel actually begin asking some questions that he's prepared ahead of time. And for those of you who are um, tuning in later within the recording, we're going to be talking about uh, Christian agnosticism in this show. And perhaps if we have time, we'll move on to some other issues. But uh, yeah, I mean, Samuel was interested in kind of arranging this conversation, and I was happy to host it. So Samuel, uh, you know, uh, can you begin by talking a little bit then about uh, your background with Christian agnosticism, and then we can ease into the questions that you have for Megan, uh, and possibly if I, as a traditional Roman Catholic, can contribute in any way I can. <laughs> Sam, you take it away. <laughs> sure. Um, so, as I began to do my university studies, like many people, I began questioning the prior certitudes of my you know, religious faith and tradition I was raised up in. Um, but I never really had like a, um, a dramatic shift or crisis of faith moment where I, um, you know, some people, they, they would um, go from being like quite fundamentalist or conservative to being like a fundamentalist atheist, for example. Um, um, I sort of, my evolution i suppose it was more of an evolution rather than a revolution um and so i i've become more less conservative in my politically and theologically in my my faith uh but i'm i i haven't completely abandoned the the christian faith i i still consider myself to be a part of the christian tradition if only because um, you know, like your, um, your parents, you can't deny your parents where, where ha you know, where you, where you're raised from and you, you sort of have to live with the fact that you, um, have been raised in a tradition. And I think it's important to understand the historical roots of your tradition in a specific, but also in a general way. Right. Um, yeah. Um, so I, became the, the the term agnostic christian i came across that term um when uh, a friend referred 
to a book by Leslie Weatherhead, which I think is cool. He wrote a book literally called Christian Agnosticism, or the Christian, I forgot the title, but it was something to do with being a Christian agnostic, right? And the way he defined it really resonated with me um, as I was um, evolving in my, my faith journey. Um, so, like, he, he, he defines, well, I mean, I won't go into the specific details, but basically he, he, he defined it as, like, um, what you could call a, um, what's the word, uh, latitudinarian or uh, if anyone's familiar with the latitudinarian uh, uh, Protestant movement after the Reformation, they, they, they had a, a very, they had latitude, you know, um, um, uh, in, with, in affirming dogmas or doctrine, right? So they, they, they weren't so uh, dogmatic or um, they were more tolerant of other people's, the diversity of people's theological opinions, right? Um, so they, so they emphasize a kind of minimalist, I suppose you call a mere Christianity, you should use a C.S. Lewis kind of faith, uh, uh, phrase, but, um, but yeah, so it's not, they, the way that Weatherhead defined it, he didn't really say that agnostic Christians like, deny you know like the incarnation or the trinity you know, you know the main doctrines it's just more that they had a different view on them and they were less and that they or well, he's describing himself right, right? He, he he was less certain about um uh, what it means for them to be true i think that's the, the the key thing so like for example yeah so to say that you know jesus is the human face of god um that jesus incarnates god um, there's a traditional way, you know, which um, both Catholics and Protestants have understood that, right? Um, and for, for many people, particularly after the Reformation, you know, those formula traditional formulations have been um, dissatisfactory, right? Um, so it's just, I guess, for me, it was just a journey of not so much abandoning like Christian doctrines and traditions, but just re-evaluating um and yeah just trying to understand it in a new in a new light particularly with um because of the modernity the age that we live in now which is as charles taylor says you know like um we live in the imminent frame right where there's um like a sharp distinction between natural and supernatural for example um yes yeah, so i think i'll finish my little feel there, um, introductory feel. And ask, just ask Megan, um, firstly, where did you, did, was there any place where you came across this term agnostic Christian, perhaps where the head of, and what does it mean for you, the term, and like, why do you identify it with it, I guess? Um, I, I don't remember ever coming across that term explicitly, um, it just sort of seemed like the right descriptor, yeah, for, for my position. Sorry, what was the second part of your question? Uh, so, so yeah, sort of just like, what do you, how do you define the term, but also why do you think it's, why do you identify according to it? Like, why do you think it's important to identify according to that term? Okay, yeah, so, mm, I don't know if I can give like a essentialist definition of it. Um, I mean, I think, there are some ways where you and I probably differ. If I remember correctly, um, you're not agnostic about theism, um, but rather just about Christianity. So um, I'm agnostic in both senses. Um, so yeah, in that way, I am. Uh, our, our views are probably slightly different, although we, I think, agree on, on quite a lot. Um, yeah, so I mean, for me, it's just sort of like, there's a straightforward sense in which I'm agnostic. Um, I, there's no, uh, mental like feeling of assent to these propositions one way or another. Um, maybe in some moments, uh, you know, more toward one than the other, depending on um, how my day is going. <laughs> uh, uh, that's kind of a joke, but also kind of not. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, if, if I sit down and think about it, I, I, I can't like say with honesty that I have um, a kind of uh, belief in the mentalistic sense, um, either for or against um, theism or 
uh, Christianity in particular. So um, there's kind of two layers to my agnosticism. So do you identify, nonetheless, do you, would you accept the identification or label, right, uh, Christian agnostic? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I tell people, if people ask if I'm a Christian, I say yes. Um, mm. I, uh, you know, will hope to kind of distance the, um, there's a sort of assumed link and, you know, for good reason, um, because there's a big history there of, uh, uh, you know, religious devotion being tied to belief in this, um, really doxastic sense. Um, a really mentalistic sense. And I, uh, I, would, I would like to see that decoupled at least as a necessity for uh, religious adherence. Right, and I remember, um, sorry, Samuel, to, to take over some of the questioning, but um, uh, when, you, when you talk about um, identifying as a Christian, if someone asks you the question, in what sense would you say you associate yourself with Christianity or where do you feel like you belong in terms of, let's say, uh, the Christian tradition, so to speak. Sure. So, um, I mean, in a way, I, I mean that really kind of, I don't want to say minimalistically, but um, I mean, I think a Christian is someone who tries to follow Christ. Um, and in that sense, I certainly hope, you know, that most days I'm a Christian. <laughs> uh, I hope all days I am. <laughs> um, but I mean, there's, there's another sense that I think is important. There's a philosopher who's kind of rising in um, at least, uh, well, I think rising in prominence in general, uh, named Philip Goff, and he is a Christian fictionalist. Um, so there's a difference uh, between uh, what I think and what he thinks, which is that he has this explicit belief that um, Christianity is not veridical kind of in any way. Um, and, and yet he kind of um, goes, uh, he does, you know, the, the Christian things, he goes to church and um, prays kind of. Um, I am doubtful that all of these things are what they are if one explicitly thinks that um, Christianity is false. I am sort of doubtful that uh, maybe, you know, thinking words in your head is praying or something like that. Um, not to, I mean, I don't really know. I mean, I think um, Philip's a great guy with really interesting um, beliefs, but um, I would want to distinguish agnosticism from fictionalism for sure, yeah. All right, Sam, um, I'll, I'll let you, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, but that's, I mean, that's basically just what I mean when I say, I mean, I, I have certain, certain theological commitments that are going to be, you know, contingent on the truth of these things. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's just what I mean by Christian. Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting that you brought up um, Christian fictionalism because um, a, a lot of people that, um, I know that have also used the term Christian agnostic. They have um, actually been more associated with that kind of uh, uh, movement, if you will. Like the, um, that, but it's interesting that you want to distance yourself. Uh, like I also would want to distance myself from those um, people because, um, well, the reason why I, I, I don't really, I mean, I understand the impulse behind why, you know, um, they are frictionalists um, because they are, in a sense, trying to um, deconstruct something, a, 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 a static, dualistic view of, like, you know, the way in which nature and supernature interact. And so that's why they say that, you know, the supernatural uh, myth or, mythos or the imaginary is, you know, just fictional, right? Because we live in the modern age, blah, blah, blah. Um, but... As I think I was saying to you um, on a on a comment a few a few weeks ago, um, I um I think that um, you know the that the view of religion which you know views it as a kind of a rigidly foundationalist system, you know, which is predicated upon um, you know the idea that um, a tradition must be um, have what what I called like a literal univocal and like perspicuous understanding of scripture. Like um I, I think that that is usually the uh root of um from what as far as I can tell with um the disillusionment with um Christianity or religion in general that um the 
the fictionalists sort of they are they epitomize you know so they are not the only people who who see this problem um but um yeah so the reason why i just as myself on them is just because i i think that um identifying revealed religion per se with that particular understanding or interpretation of revealed religion is a mistake um i think that um yeah so i, I think uh that um well I'll, maybe i'll go into my views a little bit later but basically i i i um just to say a little bit more about my views just to clarify so yeah it's, you're you're right that i i am less uh less agnostic about classical theism um than christianity per se um but i still wouldn't want to um say that my understanding of classical theism which is largely shaped by the the um neoplatonist tradition um i wouldn't want to say that i'm 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 particularly certain or claim to know that it's true right um and so yeah so there's there's always i think it really comes down to like where what you mean by agnostic and when you where are using the word agnostic like which context are using the word because i think um well it is a, it has just so many different meanings to different people um like thomas henry huxley's hard definition of an agnostic is a common one that people have right um but um yeah anyway i think i'll unless you have any thoughts i might move on to another question that i have yeah. Um, yeah. So were you asking like how I was using the term agnostic? I couldn't. Um, kind of. I mean, you can, you can answer that if you want. Yeah. Um, well, I think how I'm using it as something that can only exist in kind of the, the modern and postmodern era. Um, I don't know that you can really have agnostics in the ancient world. So I'm, I mean, maybe, maybe you can, but it's much harder, right? Um, that in this, in the sense that we're so practically removed from um, uh, uh, the world of kind of constant engage, like religious engagement, um, and uh, and and you could either go along with it or explicitly reject it. And now we're kind of in this in this weird um, place in history where like the the religious lives are still out there. But they're not, um, they don't have to be part of your life. You can choose it or not choose it. And it kind of, kind of doesn't, you know, it's, it's up to you. Um, and that's weird. And it's uh, created this, I know you and I are both fans of Charles Taylor. And so you mm. know what I'm talking about for sure. But um, it makes it such that, you know, people are in this position they were never in before, where um, now you just sit back and you evaluate the arguments. And that's how you come to have the ability to answer these questions when people ask it of you. Do you believe in God? Are you an adherent of religion, you know, X, Y, or Z? Um, and, and you kind of do that on the basis of looking at the evidence and arguments as opposed to just what uh, would, would otherwise be, as Taylor calls it, your spontaneous social imaginary. You just can't help but um, sort of uh, be affirming these things in everything that you do or be rejecting these things in everything that you do. So I guess I mean by agnostic something pretty boring, um, which is just that as someone in 2021, uh, you know, I'm, I've looked at the arguments and there's really good ones on both sides. <laughs> yeah, Megan, do you mind if I come in real quick? Um, I wanted to ask you, so you mentioned earlier that you have like a theological commitments or uh, you, you hinted at something like that. Um, and of course, I, I'm sure that you, when you may, when you say theological commitments, you don't necessarily mean it in the way that, let's say, it's been traditionally used, of course, right? So what, what are those theological commitments that you have? Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I just mean it to be contingent ones. So, uh, okay. you know, mm -hmm. let's say, uh, good news, there is a God. Um, you know, <laughs> good news, Christianity roughly is true. So um, in, in that case, I have, you know, assuming those things are true, I have things that I think um, that I hold to as, as being more probably true than other things. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, like right. A, so this a, is, 
Agnosis and other things. Huh? So yeah, so like the the agnosticism that we're talking about here is kind of like a me would it be fair to say like it's a degree of confidence that you have in the truth of some proposition or you know or it's um it's contrary. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, it's definitely just uh, the 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 you know credence that I would assign to different propositions were they to be thrown at me. Yeah. Mm. All right, Samuel, do you wanna, do you have any other questions to add? Um, well, I just one thing I wanted to briefly mention, which we've also talked about before, well, I've talked to Megan about before is like um, the, um, your, pa your paper on, you know, seen a dark, put through a dark, uh, a mirror darkly. Um, um, it hints at something that I think is quite important, um, which is distinguishing um, like, the idea of faith being distinguishable from belief, right? Um, having so, so um, I think it's often lost in the conversation um, what faith means, you know. Um, and then, if so that you have, so like, for example, when you have um, someone, uh, I've forgotten the philosopher's name, who, who came up, uh, Louis. What is it? Who came up with the idea of faith without belief? Um, I've forgotten his name. <laughs> um, do you remember? Pat? Never mind. Um, okay, so basically, um, I, I found this idea of faith without belief quite illuminating for my own journey, um, but also quite helpful because um, I, I think it's, it genuinely is possible to have um, to, to commit to, um, have faith in, um, uh, yes, Louis po Poman is his name, that's fine. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, so, um, anyway, yes, I think it's possible to have faith without belief. So if you, without belief, propositional belief in certain propositions to do with, like, you know, the salvation relevant propositions that a lot of Christians think about, right? Um, yeah, so, I was wondering whether you just had any. So I'm going to move a little bit. Uh, move on to my next question now. So thoughts on how the church or churches can help or like do better in their um their attitude towards people like us who are um I would describe as like sort of faithful doubters. It's a paradoxical term I quite like. Um yeah. So perhaps. Yeah. So what do you think that uh, the church can do? Oh, man, I have so many thoughts on this, um, <laughs> which, you know, which isn't fair. I mean, churches are pretty much, you know, they're doing they're doing their best. But um, I mean, I think one thing there's so here's here would be a good place to start um, for churches and especially leaders in the church to recognize um, kind of how people come to believe things and thereby recognize why um, it's not as easy for us to have beliefs about these things as it was for people in the Middle Ages to, for like really good reasons. Um, I don't think a lot of people recognize that and fair enough, um, but I think it's important if you wanna address the issue of doubt, you have to know what beliefs are and why they form, how they form. <laughs> uh, you know, you can't just like, uh, replace your youth pastor and then just like grumble about like Zoomers. Um, so that would be a really good place to start. Um, and then coming off of that, I think uh, exactly what you were saying, um, that there's, a, that there's a, a distinction between belief proper and, um, and acceptance in that both um, can, uh, can, can lead to faithfulness. Um, and that uh, if you have, you know, genuine acceptance leading to faithfulness is, is the, is this the, you know, the belief that in that sense is the, the feeling of mental assent is the lack of, you know, doubt or struggle. Is that um, important? Uh, is it something that we really need to, to emphasize? I don't, I don't think it is. So those are, those are two things right there that I think would be um, helpful, yeah, for like you said, for people like us. Did you have any thoughts on that? 
go on. Um, <laughs> you know that I've had thoughts about this whole show. <laughs> yeah, Megan, uh, yeah, I've been really, I've been really enjoying this conversation, and I just want to be careful, you know, because I don't want to take the thunder from Samuel, right? If he has more questions, but um, oh no, I don't. Well, I don't oh, have cool. that many. So you can just, you can go ahead and share your thoughts. Right. So then, yeah. as the one, um, you know, kind of traditional Roman Catholic slash Christian in the chat. <laughs> Coming from my perspective, right, I want to be honest about how I see the conversation, right, and then to get your thoughts on it, right, because in some sense, I am that kind of like middle age person pulled out of the middle ages, right, and dropped into the 21st century to some extent, um, right, so suppose a traditionalist is watching this video, and he or she says to themselves, I don't know why we need to change the definition of faith or, you know, uh, kind of maybe widen the terms from how I understand it, right? So why is it the case that we need to make these accommodations? Or, or why is it the case that the uh, Christian agnostic wants to use these particular terms, right? And, and incorporate it into their new understanding. So Megan, what are your thoughts on that? Um, good question. Uh, well, here's, here, here might be one reason. Um, they might want to have a broader understanding of faith that gets away from the mentalistic feeling of confidence or certitude uh, because they don't want to have to rely on um, maybe dishonest members. Um, so you see a lot of, uh, you know, churches need to stay alive to some extent. They need to have people in them. <laughs> um, and um, there's just no end to the kinds of advice that people give about how to keep, you know, the youngins in uh, the church. Um, but, uh, so what happens is that you get a lot of people who will go because it's nice, um, because they like it, you know, up until they don't. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and what am I trying to say? So Kierkegaard has this notion um, that I think is, is really important, that uh, faith, uh, particularly he's talking about Christian faith, is a matter of being what he calls contemporaneous with Christ. So that is to say, um, relating to the events of the incarnation and the resurrection as a presently occurring thing and not as a event in the historical past. This is much easier to do when your practical life is um, constantly centered around religious movements mm -hmm. of ritual and ceremony. Mm. Or um, sacraments, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, right. Um, mm. Yes, of course. Uh, and, and, but, but every moment of it, right? Not mm. just uh, once or a few times a week, uh, but just really most moments of life. Um, and I think that it's just, it's not the case that that's going to be um, what our world is like, again, ever. Um, and so given that, I think that we can kind of meet people where they are, which is thrown into a situation where the kind of belief that was possible then isn't possible now, but there's something that's possible now. There's some kind of faithfulness that's possible now. Um, or we cannot. And I guess one of those strikes me as more Christian than the other. <laughs> yeah, because I think that a lot of um, traditionalists uh, would view kind of like the term Christian even of itself and whoever identifies as a Christian as kind of like, this is my baby, right? So I'm not just going to hand my baby around, you know, and, you know, it, it's kind of like that uh, possession, so to speak, right? And um, I guess to speak a little bit about myself and to get your perspective on it, um, you know, there are different ways in which people start to make the term Christian, let's say, exclusive or their personal possession. And and these reasons aren't always, let's say, um, you know, uh, malevolent, right? It's not because they genuinely just want to uh, push people out. But for instance, uh, in my personal faith journey, I've realized that the more that I've studied my kind of racial identity and the more that I've wanted to recover my Asian roots, the deeper my faith has been impacted by wanting to go back to how Christ and the original apostles and the, the first century Palestinian Jews and Hellenistic Jews would have understood the faith, right? To the point where for me, like 
the, all this stuff about, you know, the, the, you know, the modern age and postmodernism, I'm just kind of like, yeah, well, you know, I feel like my Christianity is literally from a different time. And my crisis from a time in which um, this wasn't so mysterious, right? So that when I see others having these types of questions, I don't have them because in some sense, I've wrapped up my understanding of Christ within my understanding of my own kind of racial and ethnic context. So I'm sure that then, you know, for someone in the West, let's say, who has had this kind of what Taylor calls a disembedding, so to speak, or social disembedding, that would be kind of different. Um, what, do you, what do you think about that, especially the, the cultural element of it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, you, you know, take your um, average, uh, especially, I mean, there's, it's, you know, it's no secret that white people are the least religious uh, in America. And that's, I mean, that, you know, probably a, a large contributor to that is because, you know, they're right. We don't have a culture, you know, our, this, this, is, this is our, <laughs> we don't have a culture. Um, yeah. And, uh, and so certainly, right. So you have, um, like a really vibrant Christian culture in, um, uh, in, in, in your culture, I'm sorry, are you Filipino? Do I no, I'm Zo I'm Zomi. So I'm from Northeastern India. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I apologize. Somewhere no, that's around. so, that's totally okay. I, I like the Filipino people and you know, they like me, so we're all good. <laughs> and of course, like a vibrant Christian community in the African American community right. in America as well. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I am quite sure that that's a large contributor because this, because, uh, you know, ritual and ceremony are things that, um, uh, will, will shape family gatherings and family traditions. And, um, so that's another way of being practically engaged in, uh, the world as though a particular reality were the case. Um, uh, which is why you see, uh, you know, at large amounts of, um, uh, a, a large uh, percentage of the, the Jewish community is um, not theistic, um, but they're still quite religious uh, in a very real sense. Um, I guess a, a, to answer, to say a little bit more about your last question about, you know, sort of, you know, why should we want to maybe redefine or rethink what faith is to accommodate or whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, and I guess my, my question might be, what's like really lost if we get rid of the, uh, the, this like mentalistic feeling of certitude? Um, do we lose anything? Do we lose anything really important if we get rid of that? I would say that, well, it depends on what you mean by this mentalistic thing, right? Because I want to make sure that I'm understanding you properly. So for instance, are we talking about, uh, you know, Samuel had a question about this in, in the document, but let's say like in Vatican I, it talks about how you can achieve, a man can achieve a natural certainty of the existence of God by reason. So a natural meaning, you know, through the just pure contemplation without the need of divine revelation, so to speak or any unique kind of experience, just encountering his world and synthesizing and understanding it. Is that what you mean by kind of like this mentalistic ascent or? Um, I, suppo I, I suppose I just mean something as, as kind of boring <laughs> as, you know, someone says, uh, you know, is Christianity true? And you're sort of like, um, I hope so. I'm not for sure. Um, right, yeah. Well, I'm, yeah, I mean, like, it depends, because if you're talking to like a traditionalist, right, and you ask them, is, is there a God, they're going to be like, yes, and then you're going to ask them, are you, what, you know, is there, is, is the Christian God the true God, and you're going to say, they're going to say yes, right, so it's not, at least hopefully it's not just a stale proposition to them, right, it's going to be something that, well, is a worldview, and it's going to change everything, hopefully, about them, and move and shape them, right, so I mean, like, um, I mean, if, are you talking about just um, in general, this kind of strict way of asking the question and answering it, right? Is there a God? Yes. You know, is, is it that kind of rigid um, way in which we a ask the question, have that discourse that you're kind of critiquing or? Yeah, kind of. So Kierkegaard gives, a, uh, I'll bring him up again, because he gives a really nice illustration mm -hmm. uh, of the distinction between these two kinds of certainty. So he talks about, mm. Uh, well, there are these two, um, these two lovers, two people in love, and um, <laughs> and they, you know, they do what lovers do. They're like, you know, they're mushy and they, you know, hold hands in public and you know, write each other poetry <laughs> or whatever. Um, and uh, and they're just fully immersed in this. And then, you know, one day, I, uh, you know, the 
the, the guy's friend kind of takes him aside and he's like, so are you sure that she is in love with you and she's not just playing you? Um, and he stops and he's sort of uh, thrust out of that role as uh, the lover in the moment. And now he's kind of trying to critically examine this thing from a third personal perspective. And now he's not sure. Mm. Um, and I think that's kind of what I'm talking about. Uh, mm. That when, when thrust out of the practical engagement of it, you're not sure. Um, but that, that doesn't really tell you anything interesting about what he was like before he got asked the question. Um, does that make more sense? Right. So are you, are you saying like the mentalistic ascent, if I'm, if I'm using the term properly, as you put it, right. And giving that part up, is it more like when the guy, um, is asked the question and then he suddenly has to step out, right? So it's now, it's no longer just a practical thing. It actually becomes a question of intellectual substance. You know, yeah. do I have enough, do I have sufficient reason to believe that she loves me or whatever? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, whereas when he was in love and just in the motion and necess not necessarily thinking about it as an intellectual endeavor, it, it conferred a kind of certainty or, or um, certitude over him. Yeah, a, a kind of certitude in the sense that it, mm. it, it guided what he did. Um, it was yeah. as, as mm. though in every way it was his reality. Yeah, yeah. So then, yeah. So then I, I could see how some traditionalists, they would they would be more like the guy in love and then they would use the dogmas as ways of like protecting that love, so to speak, without necessarily um, intellectually assenting to those dogmas in a way that's like, I, I can defend them and I believe them to be rational, right? Whereas there are those yeah. few, um, you know, like, you know, yours truly perhaps who, who, who tries to do both. And you're saying um, that, isn't that isn't necessary, so to speak. Yeah, and I mean, I, I right, so I don't think it's necessary. I also think that, um, that the, the, the historical shifts could have, you know, shifted these, um, you know, perhaps it was, it was true that by the, by the, you know, pure uh, lights of reason, um, back when this was written, you could actually reason your way, you know, um, in, in a world where, where true atheism wasn't even really a live intellectual option. Um, Maybe, you know, maybe that was the case and then, but maybe things have changed now such that by whatever reason, pure reasoning is now, um, maybe that's not true. Yeah, and then um, what, one thing I appreciate about this perspective then is that, you know, for instance, uh, I talked to you about how my culture kind of influenced my perspective. And then you've talked about now how the current state of Western culture, where we are now, modernity, post-modernity, um, that also influences then how you're going to interpret someone who says, I have natural certainty that there is a God. You're going to say, well, yeah, perhaps back in, you know, was it like uh, the 1860s when Vatican I happened, right? Uh, or I hope I got that right. Don't crucify me. But, um, you know, around that time, you know, so to speak. But so you would really contextualize reason itself and not treat it this as this pure abstract endeavor, which I think is commendable, right, in, in, in what you're doing. Um, or it's honest. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think that's necessary just because what is and isn't a live option for belief shifts so much that uh, what can be uh, arrived at by reason alone is, is, is going to shift when the options change. All right. And I'm going to let Samuel now come in and see if he's satisfied with the conversation we've had on Christian agnosticism or if he wants to move on, but really quick to the viewers. Uh, Vatican one began on 18, uh, 1869. So I was, I was very, you know, I said the 1860s. So I was, I was very close to being wrong, but I still was in the range. So, uh, <laughs> Samuel, uh, you, uh, you take it away. Are you satisfied with uh, our conversation so far in Christian agnosticism? Do you want to move on? Um, I just wanted to know, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the idea of tradition. Mm. Um, just cause I really think it's quite important because you, you've used you've identified yourself and as traditionalist and you've talked about traditionalists in general, but um, I think it's important to um, tell you what we mean by tradition because often people, um, when they speak of tradition, they juxtapose it with novelty or modernity or whatever, you know, but I think that's a mistake. I mean, like, I think that um, following um, 
Alistair McIntyre, who speaks of, you know, uh, how we are all inhabit different traditions. Um, we, I, we, so I think it's important to recognize that um, I want to draw a distinction between what um, one historian, Yaroslav Pelikan, he called tradition versus traditionalism. Um, and the way he defined this is, and I'm, I hope it's not too derogatory to those who identify as traditionalists, but um, he, he said that tradition lives in conversation with the past while remembering where we are and when we are and that it is we who have to decide. Whereas traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Um, tradition is the living faith of the dead, right? So I, 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 was, I thought of that quote because I think that where um, the Megan and I's concern um, comes from, you know, um, why we want to uh, emphasize and draw attention to, you know, the um, uh, age we live in, the secular age we live in, is because um, the that's the um, the only way in order for us to even retrieve tradition in the first place. I mean, so like, so basically what I'm trying to say is that there, there, there can't be in any um, engagement with the past, uh, with the past or, or past tradition, there can't be a direct unmediated retrieval of the tradition. There is always, there's always a mediation. There's always a um, creativity. Um, there's always a creative retrieval, essentially. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and I think that, um, that that's where I'm coming from. And I think, Perhaps where Megan's coming from as well. Um, so yeah. Um, uh, well, just one other thing I wanted to say here, which is uh, the one of the questions, or rather one of the statements, which leads up to a question that I had thought thought about, um, was that um, there's um, an agnostic. There, there's a, a a writer called Mark Vernon, who describes himself as a spiritual agnostic. I don't know if any of you've heard of him. But um, he, he wrote a book recently um, called The Secret History of Christianity. Uh, and in that book, he, he cites Owen Barfield, who was the last inkling. Um, the inkling is a, a group which, uh, in Oxford, which included C.S. Lewis and uh, J.R. Tolkien and um, others. Um, but um, uh, he, he cites Barfield in saying that life a uh, human experience of life shifts cyclically not linearly through three stages um i think these three stages are can illuminate um what i was just saying earlier about um you know how it's important to understand that tradition is always a creative retrieval rather than just a direct you know okay so the first stage um is what he calls original participation where life is experienced as a continuous flow of vitality between what is me and not me, right? So there's, there's like a porosity of being, um, you know, um, as Charles Taylor often talks about, um, there's no sharp distinction between the self and the other or that which is not the self, right? Um, then the second stage is what he calls a withdrawn participation, where there's a shift from being immersed in the life of others, nature, and God. Uh, and, and, and that's where the individual um, sort of becomes more at the forefront, where, whereas before it was at, in the background, right? And then the third stage is what he calls reciprocal participation. Where, so this is where um, an individual has a sense of belonging to him or herself, they have a certain degree of autonomy, right? But they are also, um, but, but their autonomy reflects something that is greater than them, right? Um, so in other words, they are not really autonomous in, in the end. They are ultimately dependent um, on uh, others, on nature, and then ultimately God, whatever right. that means. Um, so I think that, we are living in the second stage in this, this age of imminence. You know, I think, and I think the fact that we do live in it 
an age of what you could call withdrawn participation, you know, like a sense of alienation from, you know, the the enchanted medieval world, you know, this tale of it. Um, it's 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 important in um, assessing uh, the relevance of religion or religious questions, right? Um, but yeah, so th- I was wondering though how here's the question finally um uh how pessimistic or optimistic are you about the prospect of returning to what i could call like a participatory worldview so like essentially where you know um uh like a a neoplatonist view of reality where you know we are lesser um uh inferior or lesser reflections or emanations of um god or the divine or that which is above us right um you were, you were saying to, to me a bit earlier that you were perhaps not as optimistic that um we we can uh, that a lot of people in our age would you know be attracted to this kind of view of the world but yeah, I was just wondering whether you, whether you could elaborate upon that. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, so uh, I let me make sure I know what you're talking about. So by uh, the kind of neoplatonist world, maybe you mean what, what Taylor means by um, a porous self uh, as opposed to a buffered self, which is where we have the creation of interiority as distinct from the exterior. Um, I'm not optimistic at all. Uh, I think... Uh, sadly, I, um, as much as, as I think we would be closer to the truth about so many things, uh, including um, the truth about how to think about action and how to think about agents and how to think about so many other things, um, I don't see that happening, um, unfortunately. I think that the, uh, the, the idea of the personal self is becoming more and more and more enclosed uh, under increasing layers of um, like increasing walls to separate us from the outside world um, that I mean it would take a lot to to reverse that uh, kind of trajectory that um, that I think that we're on Um, if uh, I mean, potentially small communities of people could um, establish a sort of tradition that you're talking about. But um, yeah, I wish I had something more optimistic to say there. Um, but I do see that that third stage that you mentioned Barfield talks uh, about um, as, I mean, you see remnants of that in postmodernism, right? I mean, the dependence of um, the individual on the, you know, the, the gaze of the other. Um, uh, so you, so I, I think that that's uh, really insightful, and that it seems like um, that hasn't really. A lot of people like to, you know, make other people afraid of, like, you know, oh, postmodernism is here, and I mean, like, in a way, it is, but it, in a real way, we're still deep in modernity. So, yeah. Samuel, are you optimistic or pessimistic about getting back to <laughs> Neoplatonism? I want to know that. If you're optimistic about this, I would I would love to uh, have yeah, some. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, um, I'm optimist. My my optimism is very qualified, if it exists at all. Um, <laughs> Wise, yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, there's actually um, a a a more recent book by David Neuheiser called Hope in a Secular Age, which is continuing on um, Charles Taylor's. Uh, you know, big tome on a secular age, right? Um, and uh, uh, in that book, he, um, he 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 says that you, you can have a pessimistic hope, so you can be you can be hopeful while you so you can be pessimistic about lots of things, yet it can still be rational and reasonable to 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 have hope, right? Um, and I think that really resonates with me because um, there's lots of things that I'm pessimistic about. Um, not just politically in your country, but um, also theologically and spiritually. Um, I think these are all, all related though. I think that um, the political situation is 
absolutely um, caused by um, a deeper metaphysical um, issue, um, which um, is another huge topic to talk about. But um, but yeah, um, so where's I going with that? <laughs> yeah, so I, I agree that. Um, I think I would be, I'd, I'd agree that I'm pessimistic. I, I, think, I think I'm pessimistic about uh, lots of things to do with like um, us not uh, ret returning to a direct, to, to um, an original participation, right? You know, we, we can't, you know, do that, obviously. Um, but um, I suppose I have a little bit of hope that um, um, identifying with, Christian tradition or religious traditions can for certain types of people, right? It's so not for everyone, right? Can for certain types of people can be um, one of the best or like a good way um, in you know return uh, reaching this third stage, right? Where you've you've overcome like um, uh, you know that um, kind of feeling of alienation from like the past or something that you've sort of lost, I guess. Um, you're not that connected with um, nature or other people or that sort of thing. So, yeah, um, that's how I would answer that. <laughs> yeah, if, if you don't mind, I want to come in too, because I remember, Samuel, you, you said something about tradition that I thought I wanted to jump in and talk a little bit about. So, I mean, um, I, you know, it's been a little bit since we we, we talked about it, but um, if I recall properly, you said you, you were said basically saying something like someone who is recognizing that, you know, uh, retrieving the past is a creative um, upheaval, as you put it, or something like that, or a creative enterprise. Um, in, se in that sense, then those persons are keeping the tradition alive. And in some sense, they are better traditionalists than the traditionalists, um, so to speak. Is, it, is that a fair characterization? Yeah, so the, the point I was trying to make when I was trying to distinguish between how Yaroslav Pelikan distinguishes mm -hmm. between um, tradition and traditionalism is just that um, traditions can become stagnant to the point where they are, they either forget the past or they have a, a very selective memory of the past, which can turn into a kind of reactionary political force, essentially. Mm -hmm. and that's what I'm concerned about, right? Um, and, and I think that traditionalists unfortunately are allied with uh, a, a broader political reactionary um, uh, kind of group of people, particularly mm -hmm. in your country. Um, yeah. And so I think that the value of, um, yeah, so the value of making this distinction between tradition and traditionalism is just that, um, is to recognize that uh, traditions can be dead. They can look, you know, to, to a lot of people, they can look dead. And in order to revivify, to make tradition, uh, l l you know, have more life, you you need to um, uh, change the form. So, you, so even if the content of religion remains in many senses, obviously what, what is the content of religion is itself very mm -hmm. controversial, right? But the, the point I'm just trying to make here is just that the form needs to revolve and change even if the content whatever the content is hmm. um you know remains the same so there has to be obviously that dialectic between uh deistic or um permanence um and um uh, a flux you know a change hmm. right yeah I think, um, so I think, yeah i think one thing that happens usually though is that when people try to change when they, when people are saying oh i'm just trying to change the form what ends mm -hmm. up happening is oh the content begins to contradict what came prior to it so sure to speak. yeah right so then i mean like yeah you know so for me as the traditionalist right like uh, when someone says they want to change the form i'm like okay you know i, I like new ideas i, I want to keep the tradition alive but then if they say like oh you have to radically give up the idea of papal infallibility then i'm just going to be <laughs> like no <laughs> you know that's that's changing the content so to speak but i mean maybe to get megan mm -hmm. in on this conversation too um you know some people i mean so to, to uh, talk about maybe a Roman Catholic or even an Eastern Orthodox individual who has kind of an institutional understanding of religion that has passed mm -hmm. on what it has dogmatically decreed to passing generations. 
you know, that kind of serves as a, I, I would say, d would you agree that it serves as kind of like a more stable mooring for um, keeping that tradition alive, even into um, our age? So for instance, um, that person could consistently say, well, look, I believe that this magisterium has existed since the beginning, right? And that this is a source that I can always go back to. And it's been there from the time of Christ, from that time of, uh, of the Middle Ages and the sacred kind of when time was sacred, right? So it's kind of like um, a relic that's still living. Is that a possible way for a traditionalist to be more consistent, so to speak? Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, an immediate uh, unknown that I think um, the what you just said kind of made me realize I don't really have any good thoughts on this is kind of the extent to which um, uh, authority figures are needed for grounding and stabilizing traditions. Um, I don't, certainly they're commonly used and commonly successfully used um, to do that, but they're not always necessary. Um, so, so, I mean, I think it's a legitimate question to ask, well, can we separate these traditions from these authority structures? Um, and, uh, and still have it be the stabilizing force that it is. And I think in a lot of cases, the answer is yes, you can, um, but, um, and so uh, maybe it's just a, a bit of wisdom to know when that is the thing to do and when it's not. Um, but, I, but I mean, it's, it's certainly not going to be as, uh, maybe as reliable. Um, although, I mean, I, I, I'm not Catholic, so I, uh, you know, don't know the answer to this, but um, I mean, your average, like, you know, lay Catholic person, um, would you say that they're like, I don't know, are, are, are they more um, ritualistic, more traditionalist in this sense that you were talking about um, than uh, other uh, people of other faith traditions or other sects of Christianity? Uh, honestly, it's a, it's a very mixed bag, probably not so like I think um, I saw this poll the uh, today from like Pew Research Center that like 52% of Catholics think abortion is actually permissible in the US. So it's like, wow, it's like you're not even obeying the magisterium anymore, you know, so mm -hmm. to speak, right. So it's kind yeah. of like, they're in it, but not. Oh, well, okay, that's too exclusivistic. Um, they are like, bearing the, the the title Catholic, right, but not necessarily abiding by the quote unquote traditional norms of what identifies that person as part of the community. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I, I, I wonder whether like the, the, the causal arrows are the other way, maybe like the, uh, those who like consider these things and immerse themselves in it for them, the authority structures are going to be truly authoritative. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for the rest, they're going to simply fail to be. All right, Samuel, do you have any thoughts on this or do you have like a new question to ask? Let's see here. We have about seven more minutes left and then uh, Megan has to go. But uh, Samuel, is there anything you want to talk about at this point? Um, no, I mean, those were the sort of the main questions that I, that I had, which I sort of just asked. But like um, the last question that you raised or the last few questions that Megan has been talking about, about authority structures, I, I think is... Um, and a very important question to be asking in this climate mm -hmm. um, where there's a general distrust of authority. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I don't just mean, I don't just mean religious. I, I mean, expert, you know, you, you know, um, the, there's been a book, um, uh, I forgot the title, but it was just on, it was all on um, the distrust of experts. There's lots of books in that sort of genre, you know, in this mm -hmm. age we live in. Um, and so I think it's a really important question to ask, you know, to what degree um, should should we trust experts or, author, you know, people who are either, yeah, sort of ideologically or in some sense higher or, you know, authoritative, higher than us, right? Um, because on the one hand, I think you, you can't go back after, you know, um, from the Enlightenment um, belief that, you know, you must dare to think for yourself, you know, to use Immanuel Kant's, you know, um, sort of phrase, sapere elder, mm -hmm. in the What is Enlightenment essay, you know, um, you, you can't reverse that kind of 
attitude, you know, even if, yeah, so, so the attitude is, but what you can do is you can, you can see, you can show people the, um, the, the harms or the, um, uh, the negative effects of having that exclusively autonomous attitude, you know, um, so, you know, both politically, you know, when, when you, you have a whole lot of people in America, you know, who, who, who just have an extremely hubristic attitude towards um, scientists or experts in general, <laughs> right? Um, but also theologically, I think, you know, it's a, it's, yeah, so that's just, unless you have any final thoughts on that question, um, I didn't really have anything else to say. I mean, can I say one more thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, um, and we might even sort of be okay with people doubting expert scientists if they had like really massively let us down uh, mm -hmm. a lot in recent history. And I mean, certainly we can see that with, I mean, so many uh, different religious leaders lately. Um, so we might think, well, you know, I, I get why it's maybe even if you may, I even get why it's important to not be insulated, to take myself as the, you know, the final say, to not be the, uh, you know, the, the beacon of enlightenment thinking. Um, but I might think, okay, but I don't really take them as authority either. And maybe I'd, I'd like, I'd like to, but maybe I just can't. Um, in any case, I, I think a, a lot of people might find themselves in this situation where it's, um, even if they recognize their own insufficiency, uh, they just can't get past uh, the insufficiency or apparent insufficiencies of uh, those who are supposed to be uh, those in authority. So it's a, another complicating factor there. Yeah, I will, I'll just close then by talking about, um, yeah, and I, I really appreciate you too, like allowing me to come into the conversation and be the one conservative traditionalist person in the chat, right? I, I, I appreciate that because, um, you know, uh, to talk about where I'm coming from, let's say, I think the, the key thing, um, uh, the key motivation for a lot of traditionalists and conservatives, and especially their reluctance to accept kind of like, oh, well, we are in a postmodern or modern age, is that they, be, they view tradition as intimacy or as love in a sense. And that to ask them to give that up is to really demand so much of them, right? So, I mean, to, to talk about myself a little bit, like my, why I like believe in the magisterium or believe in the infallibility and the necessity of maintaining the traditions that have been handed down. Um, when I investigated, you know, the, the claims of Catholicism and looked at the Palestinian Jewish context of Christianity and looked at what was believed at the time of Christ and what entered into the New Testament, I think it's clear that um, the Jews of, the, of Christ's time, they believed that the Pharisees and the scribes were infallible, that the high court in Jerusalem could legitimately call upon heaven to back their decisions, right? And that Christ seems to have passed on the same structure and understanding through the apostles into the rest of the Christian movement from the beginning, clearly in the second century, and then onwards, right? So that for me, as someone who wanted to go back to my roots as an Asian, right, and go back into my cultural roots, with that being tied to my faith, to ask me to like give that up, especially that love that I've had now for going back to the roots, going back to what was once there, to ask me to give that up is to like ask me to give up a part of my heart, right, to this age here and now. And I think a lot of traditionalists, especially young people who are like, so there, there is a movement of young Catholics who are like very traditionalist and want the Latin mass and so on. And you see this even in the reactionary right, um, they view themselves as kind of escaping the world and going back to and trying to bring alive again a different time, right? And they, they view the, the present moment as perhaps something they can, or the, uh, the, the present ways of doing things as something they can possibly reject and that there's still life to bring back from the past that can be brought back again. So there's a hope, so to speak, but uh, there, there's a lot of nuances there. I don't know, that was kind of a long answer. Do you have any thoughts on that, Samuel or Megan? I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> Um, I guess I, I think that was a really lovely way of putting it, by the way, um, and helped me understand uh, a deeper aspect of that point of view. Um, maybe I'll add that I, I don't necessarily think that um, it's, even if we think the present condition is really kind of 
bleak in one sense, mm -hmm. uh, leads to a lot of suffering through doubt and felt absence of God. I don't actually know that that's a reason to reject it or want to get out of it. Um, that that itself can be uh, a gift and a means of um, kenosis, especially as, as Simone Bay talks about it. Um, so I think there might be uh, reasons to kind of sit in that place and mm -hmm do what you can there. Um, and in addition to the reasons you discussed for not doing that. That's a lovely answer, Megan. All right, Samuel, do you have anything to add? <laughs> uh, well, just to add to what Megan just said in the, about ken kenos or kenosis is um, I, um, I think that the example of Christ, you know, in the Christ 7 Philippians 2, which uses that, that verb, keno, mm -hmm. to empty, how, you know, Christ emptied himself. Um, I think the incarnation the idea of um, a human completely emptying himself to to be, to becoming you know re completely receptive or passive in a sense to um, the divine um, is um, a paradox which most which I, which I think is um, like not just indispensable but I think it's like it's the only way forward <laughs> um, it's the only way to so essentially um, there's this the paradox is just that in kenosis there's pletosis, which in Greek means fullness. So, you know, paradoxically, you know, um, in the in emptiness, you know, in the experience of emptiness and absence, there is actually the heights or the depths of fullness and presence of God, right? Um, and I, I found that um, at least that's that's true in my experience, and I think a lot of people experience that resonates with them as well so yeah. all right well with that being said once again very beautifully said samuel uh samuel's my favorite heretic no i'm kidding i'm kidding i'm kidding <laughs> i'm kidding uh i just want to uh thank all of you for coming on to the show um megan thank you so much samuel thank you so much we didn't get to the other topics but that's okay i think we had a really rich conversation here uh with that being said yeah. thank you for uh tuning into this episode